feels good to be back in the studio where we belong, looking at uh, what's going on. Now, Will, I know you, you take your job very seriously as far as gathering the news. You're a news gatherer. I try. At least that's what you call yourself. You get the, there's a badge, there's a nameplate on your desk. News gatherer. But today, I've actually prepared a few things myself. In fact, I, well, just I got a couple things I want to talk about. But first, we'll get to your stuff. Because I know you're very serious about getting straight into it. Getting straight to your stuff. So what do you have for us today? What's this? What's this headline right here? New renders leak of Samsung's 17.5-inch folding tablet. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try, try again in the form of a gigantic folding tablet. Okay, this doesn't fold like the Galaxy Fold. This folds like the folding piece or mechanism is not part of the screen. That is a weird looking thing though. Yeah, it's more like a stand. Okay, the original Samsung Galaxy View is a unique device, an 18.4 inch tablet, which was certainly never designed to leave home but more to act as a portable screen for media consumption, a niche device, yes. Well, they're going to do it again because, as you know, it's a shotgun approach. You just you put it out there in the public and you see what people do and you make way more products than, than there could ever be a purpose for. But with the increase in mobile, streaming, YouTube-centric, domestic behaviors, binge-watching, Netflix, I don't know. In a small apartment, you prop that little guy open. It's a TV on the go to go. Uh, the internals are sort of like a, an Android phone, basically. Xenos 7885 CPU, 3 gigs of RAM. It's going to run Android. Uh, what can I say about it? It's weird. Weird things are good. Uh, it's more options, potential. There's no price point. These are just renders at this point, guys. Uh, it's a very strange form factor for a tablet, maybe in a kitchen. Uh, the recipes, get a few recipes on there. I know you're a big chef, cook, Will, so it could help you out with that. But I don't think they're going to sell a boatload of them. That's for sure. Don't you agree? Yeah, I agree. They're not looking to sell a boatload. It's just another product from a company that makes thousands, literal thousands of products. It's just a weird size. 17.5. It's though they shrunk it a little bit from the last one. 18.4 down to 17.5. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what kind of internal uh, investigation they put into that. Why it should be a bit smaller, but uh, maybe for kids too. Maybe kids as a like to watch YouTube Kids or maybe some kind of drawing app or I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. What do you got next? Teen sues. Actually, I read this. I saw this one. Teen sues Apple for one billion. One billion dollars. That's a that's a crazy lawsuit. Like a billion. Like is that real? I don't think he's gonna win a billion. Like he just thinks Apple is so rich that he can just be like a billion will settle out of court. Billion should be fine. Yeah. Claiming facial recognition led to false arrest. So I read this earlier. Uh, this guy, he has an alibi. He says it couldn't have been him. He says he wasn't even in Boston where this particular robbery took place. Now, one thing a lot of people don't know, Apple stores are, are robbed on like a bizarrely frequent basis because of the value of the inventory inside the stores. In your typical town, Apple's got to have laptops, phones on hand to sell. And those things are like, they're like gold. I mean, that's how, look at this. You just pop them, jump in there, and just stack them up. Let's go. Just yank them. It's pretty wild. So Will's playing a video here showcasing how quickly these kind of grab-style robberies take place. And the Apple Store, they just have all this inventory out on display. I mean, they try to lock it up a little bit, but you really want to yank it. Go for it. So this happens fairly frequently, and Apple has been trying very hard to shut this kind of stuff down because it's not just bad from the standpoint of the lost inventory. You don't want people to be afraid. I mean, anyone who has this experience or, or watches this clip, 
they don't they don't want to be caught inside the Apple Store when a, when one of these things happens. It's not like a bank or something where you feel like there's very high security. You're in a mall, a public place. It's a bad look. Uh, anyhow, it appears that some of the technology that they put in place in order to track thefts in their stores and attempt to shut it down, some of the tech that they use seems to have misidentified one particular teen who has an alibi and couldn't have possibly been responsible if he's to be believed here, which I have no reason not to believe him. But anyhow, uh, he claims that someone stole his driver's permit, which did not have a face photo, and then used that permit to wrongly identify themselves as him when they were caught stealing $1,200 worth of Apple products, mostly Apple pencils. <laughs> See, that's the other thing, the other weird thing about Apple is that the products on the secondary market maintain their value. They move quickly and easily on Craigslist, eBay, whatever. Uh, probably Craigslist is better. You could do a cash transaction. They, ha they maintain a lot of their cash value. If you get a MacBook or an iPhone, if you've, ever, if you've ever tried to sell one after the fact, you can actually get some pretty good value for it. So for, for these guys, it makes sense to target these kind of products because they can quickly turn those products into cash without many questions asked. Anyway, so somehow Apple gets this intel that they you know thinks that this dude is responsible and they show up the police show up at his door. New York police officers arrested Ba at his home at 4 a.m. on November 20th. They knocked on his door at 4 a.m. That's some military level, that's some SWAT team, that's some CIA, that's some FBI type stuff. But then the detective saw the security footage from from the Apple store. The officer realized the person did not resemble Ba. That's the guy's last name. According to the suit, the NYPD detective told Ba that Apple security uses facial recognition technology. And the detective suspected that during one of the alleged thief's many transgressions at Apple locations across multiple states, the alleged thief had pre has presented Ba's driver's permit and falsely identified themselves as him to an Apple employee a loss prevention officer. So... This dude was impersonating this other guy, and then this guy ends up getting detained, arrested. And then, of course, he claims that uh, he, he the, the guy experienced the, the wrongly accused individual claims that his college education was uh, affected. He missed a midterm exam, and his entire first year of college, he experienced anxiety and fear. Do you think that's you, that sounds like a billion dollars to me? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I missed yeah, my college exam. Like, guys. This, I think, th I mean, this is kind of one of this sounds like a pretty bogus type of lawsuit. He just wants to obviously settle with the world's most valuable company. He's just looking for, for, I don't even think he, he doesn't even want a billion, like, he doesn't even think that's possible, but he'd be happy to accept some sort of settlement out of court. And also, he gets the headline. Mm -hmm. Like, you just sue for... You find a lawyer to put through the $1 billion claim, and you're going to get some headlines. And that's what he got here. He, he, he got a headline. I mean, he's on this show. We're talking about it right now. He's on this show right now because of it. So the teen sues Apple for $1 billion. It's kind of funny. Who knows what will come of it? I mean, he's going to have some pretty... Uh, you got to have some pretty enthusiastic lawyer here to go after, you know, Apple. They're not messing around with their legal team. Like, they got an army of lawyers. So, you want to go head to head, toe to toe. Good luck to you. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it. So, anyhow, nonetheless, $1 billion claim. Apple probably gets sued. You know what they're, imagine how many times they get sued every day. You know what? I'm going to sue Apple. No, I'm not actually going to sue Apple. I'm just, I'm just saying. They probably get sued a lot. And, but, so in order to get the headline, you got to go all the way to a billion. But it is interesting that the cops showed up at this guy's residence at 4 a.m. They were that confident. And all they had was, was some weird facial recognition tech from a local Apple store. But, we, but again, there's other weird stuff with this story that the... The, the robbery he was accused in was in Boston, and he got arrested in New York. So they had to be, like, interstate, which you would think would be the federal 
federal police. Mm -hmm. Very interesting story. I don't know. I don't know what kind of tech is they're using, but you got to expect they don't they don't like that look getting robbed all the time. So there's things they're doing. You walk in the store, you're probably being monitored. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at that, Will. All right. You got some stories to share? I do. Go with questions. I do. We're going to go back. Okay, we got questions, though. Okay, save the questions. Let's see, uh, see what I've got here. Did you hear this thing, Will, about this information coming out about the type of passwords people are using? Did you hear yeah, this? Yeah. You saw I this? About it. It's like still one, two, three, four, five, six. So the number one most commonly cracked password, the, the, where the, the, advice, the advice right now, is to change it is blink 182 <laughs> hang on no type type blink 182 password you'll see the article that i'm talking about and uh both a couple of band members from blink 182 actually tweeted on it kind of encouraging people not to do that there you go the mashable one oh maybe you maybe you clicked on it i don't know what you clicked on no no go back go back will go to the uh, mashable article right there yeah Everyone is using Blink-182 as their password. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the headline says the band is not happy about it. But in reality, the, the guy's tweet is not really that angry. He just says, you guys. But it is kind of funny that that is, that is a common phrase, a common password. It's also co commonly cracked, Blink-182. Now... Is this one of those things where it's just if you're of a certain age, when you first started creating passwords and, and, and starting accounts, the most popular band of the time was Blink-182. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and then people held on to it and they never changed it. It's quite possible. Or does it say that people who have bad passwords or p people who are not very smart in the password department happen to be fans of Blink-182? Is that offensive? That, might, that's, that could be a very offensive way of looking at it. Blink-182 fans not so smart in the password department. I don't know. It's weird because if you look at the rest of the list, there's no other band. The Cowboys are in there. You would expect stuff like that. Man United, Superman, Liverpool. I don't know. What is that? I love you, CNN. I don't think that's this supposed to be. be a troll. Yeah, I don't think that's supposed to be in there. But uh, Michael is a password. These are weird. I don't know what you guys are doing out there in the password department. But uh, it ain't going to work, guys. You got to mix it up. You got to get those uh, case sensitive. You got to get those extra characters in there. And if you are currently using Blink-182, take this as a warning. People would be hackers are out there guessing that. And why wouldn't they be? It's at the top of CNN's list. So uh, it's time to update your, your password. It doesn't really matter how much you like Blink-182. It's, it's a bad password. All right. I got something else here, Will. Apparently, uh, apparently, Android, Google, is experimenting with killing the back button. Did you hear about this? No. Yeah, so in Android Q, there is apparently some experimentation with going to a more gesture-based back button situation, similar to the iPhone. Some are saying iPhone-inspired. So Apple users can rejoice. Here is, uh, here is Google embracing iPhone-ish behavior. Uh, so what does it say? The back button has been steadfast feature of Android. I use the back button. I love the back button, as you know. While phone makers using Android often have their own methods and options for navigation. So, of course, the skins that you can expect on different, from different manufacturers on Androids, like the One UI on Samsung devices. And the iPhone 10 and forward uses a rightward swipe from the left edge of the handset as a back command. That is how this implementation looks. And if Will scrolls down a little bit, you'll see, ooh, they took, they took the video down, or maybe it's just a technical error. It's a gesture, and you can swipe to the left or to the right, and it works as a back button. It's a very strange feature at this point in time, and it is strictly an experimentation. So after examining a leaked version of Android Q it obtained last month, XDA developers have found a new command to go back. In the build dated January 2019, you can now swipe leftwards on the pill in order to go back. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the back button is dead. 
And I'm sure even if Android by default moves in this direction, they're probably going to leave the option available to use a more traditional back button, which is probably something I would do, to be honest. But it does kind of, it does kind of showcase how gesture-based smartphone interaction is prevailing. It's becoming more popular. And also how these brands take inspiration from one another. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really mean very much. All that it means is that they're trying to improve their OS and taking a look at the, the various ways, the diversity in which people interact with their devices. It goes both directions, okay? Maybe in some cases Apple does something first and then, and then maybe Android takes it and then Android, something happens on Android and iOS takes it. And right now, Will's showing me a super old school device here. Is that a Palm device? It's a Palm Pre. With the uh, web OS. With web OS. And this is showcasing swipe gestures all the way back then on that particular device. And it's tiny. And that was in 2010. So look, I'm not I'm not one that likes to jump on this type of stuff and 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 lambast some company, especially in the software department. I'm like, hey, if it's a better scenario if it, if it creates a better user experience go for it and then everyone benefits and we all interact with our devices in a better more efficient manner but i'm not sure that this particular improvement is an improvement because i'm a fan of the back button so we'll see what happens but it could be the first sign that the back button on android could be under attack from android itself so just be aware all right be careful i got one more thing i want to talk about will is that all right with you yep did you know that Apple employs a full-time professional philosopher on staff? That's the job title. Hmm. It's kind of it's kind of like it's basically like uh, your job title over here. It's a new job title. You're no longer news gatherer. You're full-time professional philosopher. Type that in. Bring up the news story. It's kind of funny. Uh, where, I can't remember where I read the article. I don't know if it was Wired or what it was. You'll see in a second here, uh, or maybe not. Full put full time. It is that guy, Joshua Cohen. That's who it is. But put full time philosopher, Apple. There you go. Apple has a full yeah. Click on that. So this wh wherever this was originally reported, they had asked for an interview with this guy, and he wanted to do the interview, but then Apple said no chance. We're not going to let you do it. And he asked in like 2017, and then he asked again at one point in 2018. And once again, they said, no, you cannot. You cannot talk to the public. You are an in-house philosopher only. Now, I mean, the word philosopher, there's a lot of baggage there. It kind of sounds pretentious, obviously. But it is, it is a profession. I mean, there are professors that teach philosophy, for example, are they philosophers? I mean, who, are we all philosophers to a certain degree? Maybe it's possible. This is the guy. He wanted to do the interview. Apple said no. Apparently, he's somewhere in the training department. He, he, when, you get, when Apple has new recruits, uh, he's kind of responsible for sharing the philosophy. He also wrote some books. It's just kind of funny. It's kind of a funny thing that I found. You can imagine... What it, what it might be like to be in the presence of Apple's full-time philosopher on staff. You, you would expect it would have a, a really strong Apple tinge to it. Here's what he does, okay? In 2014, Apple hired Joshua Cohen, a full-time philosopher, at Apple University. You see, that's the other piece. Apple is not just a company that sells you phones. It's also a university. I don't, you didn't know that, Will. It was founded by Steve Jobs in 2008 to offer training programs to employees. So employees could train in, in sort of new departments within the company. It's a huge company. So there's a lot of training that happens internally and people moving from one department to the next. According to Quartz, the philosopher at Apple University, Cohen, was not allowed to talk about his work. Further, the report noted that though the philosopher at Apple University was ready to talk about his work, he said that he needed to get permission from Apple. Well, this is not surprising. Apple is, is tremendously secretive, and they're not going to let their philosopher just go out and ph philosophize out in the world. Uh, Cohen originally gave a similar lecture to Apple employees. The website said Cohen's job at Apple is to identify the best things and explicate them. Whoa. 
That's a heavy, that's some heavy uh, description there. This guy's got a got a got a, a very serious gig. Who knows what he's talking about at Apple University? Uh, I'm sure it's really fun and inspiring, and uh, I'm sure it just it just enhances your experience there at Apple. It makes you want to double down, look for that promotion, change directions, build the next great product, build the next iPod. There will uh, iPod is still hanging around. Anyway, that's what I wanted to share today, Will. Let's get to the questions. Remember, you can send in your questions as well before I get into these. All you got to do is email will at lulater.com. And it's any question. It doesn't matter. Like it's, uh, I know you guys are tech fans. It's a lot of tech-related stuff, but you can ask anything. It could get personal. It's up to you. You know, I'll address it. That's the thing. So will at lulater.com. Send your questions. He looks through them. He picks them. And we address here on the channel. So go ahead. What do you got? Hey, Lou, I was wondering, what do you think of virtual reality in its current state? Do you think VR will get to the point in our lifetime where you can have a full boy experience? Body, I'm guessing. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's just a it female be. who wants to have a boy experience. Well, could be. full body experience and not be able to tell the difference from reality. How many more years do you think this will take? For sure. Simulation theory, baby. I mean, where are we? What are we doing? It's a, it's a big, big conversation, obviously. Uh, VR is obviously not there yet. It's not convincing anyone yet that, that maybe they should rethink their, the current state of reality and what they, what they believe to be real and fake and, and so forth. But... It's so obvious that eventually it'll be the case. It's so obvious. Will just brought up the Unreal Engine again. Every time he uh, wants to showcase the future, he brings up this video right here. I'm pretty sure he watches it every night. This is uh, bedtime material for Will. He likes to look at the, the future of CG. And this is evidence that like when you, once you get up to speed, you get the frame rate right, you get the, the resolution right, and the rendering and, and, and whatnot, it's, 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 it's easy to understand that eventually you could have an experience a lot closer to our impression of reality than what we have through video games and virtual experiences at the moment. So there's another part of the question, though, that wasn't just about if, but it was about how many more years, time, how much time, if and when. Oh, that's so hard. That's so hard. When will it be exactly lifelike? I would say 20 years, maybe. I'm just throwing that out there. Do you think it's going to be like augmented reality as well? Well, the, the, I think the augmented experiences will be different than the virtual ones. They'll be different. They'll be prevalent. They'll be important too. But uh, will it, it won't be interchangeable with real life even in 20 years, I don't think. But I think in 20 years, you'll, be, you'll have something quite close. I'm just speculating right now because I was asked to speculate. But I think you'll have experiences that are very similar to real life and convincing. But one thing I've learned about technology in the amount of time that I've been interested in it is that like the things that end up happen, happening or developing more quickly than expected are things you couldn't have predicted. And the ones that, you're, that are tempting or seductive to predict take longer than you expected. Like the flying car thing. Exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, right? Blade Runner. Oh, that's... Blade Runner took place in what? 20... I mean, whatever it was, it actually happened. The year has already passed. And if you've seen Blade Runner, it's like Tokyo times a million. Mm -hmm. So the places, the most, the most obvious or evident places where you can imagine progress taking place, it, it's not... For whatever reason, it doesn't happen there. But then other places where you didn't see it happening as fast, like in smartphones or the internet, then those things are like rocket fuel straight to the moon. So anyway, 20 years, something cool will happen. It's not going to be overnight, not in this department, not in my opinion. But the progression brings everything into question. So it's an interesting subject, nevertheless. Next up. How much do you think Apple will wait to release a foldable phone and what could that look like? Whoa. Well, I got a lot of uh, feedback from Apple fans that were, you know, ready to pile on to Samsung and say, look, they're, they're stupid. 
that's the product is garbage and all that. Uh, but then it, it's hard to imagine that there is some kind of implementation which is completely seamless and where most people would consider Apple's level or polish to be because the Galaxy Fold, the only foldable phone I've had any interaction with, it's not perfect. And I think that's kind of why it's perfect for Samsung because it's not perfect and because they're one of these companies that can approach things like that knowing, knowing full well that it's fringe material, kind of like the original Note, which was weird and people didn't want and, and people got made fun of and then it became an entire platform that people loved. It's harder for Apple because they're so well established, so successful, and they kind of created this category with the original iPhone that when they do something, it's like the expectation for polish is kind of on another level, not just for outsiders, but for their own customers, for the, you know, for the Apple customer. Even though there's this stuff that gets moved around, talked about, stuff about Apple sheep and things like this where people would just just love everything that comes out of Apple. I don't really believe in that that much. I think that's more, that's something that is amplified online in the echo chambers that exist on social media. I don't think in real life that that is as prevalent as it might seem. I think, I think people want their products to work for them and they want to believe they're, that they're high quality. And so because of that, I just don't see how the current tech can be implemented in a fashion that where you don't have the crease, for one, and where you don't have the fragility associated with moving parts in a hinge. Like what, how, what, how else is something folding in solid state? Like until this stuff is so small that it's like folding a sheet of paper in your pocket, how do you do this in a seamless manner? So if Apple does it, it's going to take some time and other companies are going to have to nail it first. Like there's going to have to be some products in the market that have shown some level of demand or interest. And, and then maybe at that point, Apple will get involved. And of course, it'll be said that they're copying. But the other thing to remember about Apple is that they actually do sell iPads. Whereas Android tablets from other manufacturers are basically a complete failure. They don't move big numbers. Apple, on the other hand, would be cannibalizing some of its own sales by giving you this thing that's both a phone and a tablet. And I think actually iPhones getting bigger has already kind of done that to a degree. It's made the iPad less appealing. I remember when the original iPad came out, I've owned every single iPad up until this point. And when that original iPad came out, it was like people were hyped for that thing. It was like, wow, all this stuff I love about my iPhone, but bigger. And then iPhones got so big that it was like, ah, I can't even bother reaching for it anymore. You look at this like 10s Max or whatever else. And the iPad is just, it's getting less use. I'm not, I still use it from time to time, but it's getting less use because of it. So there's plenty of concepts out there of what an Apple foldable phone could look like. Some people are speculating that Apple could do a foldable tablet before a foldable phone because the requirements or expectations from a durability standpoint, for whatever reason, seem to be different. A tablet can kind of sit at home on a coffee table, bedside table doesn't have to go in your pocket. doesn't have to deal with the rigors of daily life. doesn't have to travel with you as much. Or if it does travel with you, it probably has a bag or a case or something like this. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's what we end up seeing. Maybe we see an Apple foldable tablet first. But keep in mind, Apple buys its displays from Samsung. It's working to try to buy displays from LG. But if you want foldable, then you're in the OLED department. If you're in the OLED department, you're squarely staring Samsung in the face. So is Apple comfortable with purchasing this brand new tech in volume, the volume it would need to create a product from one of their competitors. I was reading a story actually this morning about how much bandwidth or how much web service Apple buys from Amazon, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million bucks a month, something like this. Apple web service, Amazon. So like for iCloud, your iCloud stuff, yeah, $30 million per month from Amazon web services. So that's Apple sending Amazon $30 million billed monthly in exchange to use their web services. Now, this is not unusual. All kinds of companies use Amazon's web services, all kinds of apps. Their back end lives on Amazon web services. But it's just an interesting, it's an interesting detail in, in a weird world where all these companies are forced to sort of interact. I mean, Google, Google pays Apple a tremendous amount of money so that Google can remain default search engine when you pop open Safari on your brand new iPhone. 
So they're kind of interacting in these very bizarre and, and unexpected ways. So for Apple, they have to be comfortable with Samsung seeing the upside of their potential foldable device in the form of the material sales for these displays. And they may not be so comfortable with that. For now, it's okay. I mean, they are buying displays actively from them right now. But this all relies on their relationship remaining nice and tight. We, you saw the dispute between Qualcomm and Apple mm -hmm. uh, recently. And then you see something like this where they're, where they're actively uh, communicating, participating, uh, collaborating with Amazon. It's like it's becoming harder to exist in a silo in this space and so these types of endeavors, when it, when, when it comes to experimentation, let's say, in the land of a folding phone, it's a bit more complicated, com complex than it might appear on the surface. For Samsung, it's a bit easier, the experimentation. They just reach into the back room. They go into the, into the lab around the corner and they go, oh, I need to hand me one of the OLED displays, hand me one of the Xenos chips, do you know what I mean? They can actually in-house do this experimentation. Apple needs to pull parts from different places and then be sure that those various suppliers of those parts can meet the criteria they would need for a manufacturing run. And oftentimes when you end up seeing uh, inventory or supply issues on, on, on Apple's side, a lot of that can be fr from their supply side which is why the supply chain mastery of Tim Cook is what always gets talked about, is that they need all these pieces to play out perfectly for them to go after a product. So it's not so easy. It's not just strictly experimentation. It's also the whole business back end associated with putting out a good product at the volume necessary, the pace necessary, the caliber necessary. This is not in-house for Apple. Their devices are a culmination, a combination of components that come from various places. Good question. Like that. Okay, we can end it off with this. Okay, last question of the day. Hey guys, what's up? Quick question. What happened to Lou the musician? Cheers. So this is where this is where things get. Very, this is a personal. It's a personal question. It's not tech related. So I can give you a little bit of backstory on this channel right here. And this channel uh, originally, it was well, much like the last answer, it was an experimentation. And I was posting some some of my music over here, and that was fun. Did that for a while, and Will can still find it, I guess. Maybe yeah, it's been re-uploaded. I think it's this yeah the second one there. Now that's gonna have views. No 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 not that one. That's oh. the third one. The second one yeah this guy Quinn appears to <laughs> re-uploaded it. Anyway, I was just doing like like I said experimentation, some beatboxing, and like I mean I had this really cool board. I don't even remember, I think it was Roland. I think it was a Roland board where you could, you could do loops and have some fun. And uh, at the old studio before I got this place, I had a nice little music setup. And you know, I, that's how I used to meditate a little bit and uh, different type of expression. It was fun, some people were into it, but uh, I decided to, to kind of uh, shift the direction of this channel a little bit so that I could, I could talk in a more casual way with this, through the same kind of inspiration of the original channel, which was to have just a, a more unfiltered uh, way to express and communicate and interact. Now that was originally through music and now it's through this type of discussion, long form, no edits. It's you, it's me, it's Will. And so I don't know if that's ever gonna come back, who knows, inspiration could strike at any moment. But I probably wouldn't post it here. I probably would create another space now at this point to post something like that. Uh, but I mean, that's the guy. I'm still there. I'm still, I guess I'm still that guy. You know, that's years ago now, though. That was like three years ago. And, but I'm having fun with this. And I'm glad that I could rejuvenate the Lou later name in a kind of new way. In a, in, in a recontextualize the concept. Because truthfully, Will, I gave it some thought and I was thinking, you know, it's a fun way to express yourself, music. It's great. But like I started to think about the web and YouTube in general and like the kind of stuff that I was watching and the kind of stuff that the algorithm, the algorithm, 
was pushing and encouraging and uh and i thought to myself you know i would like to contribute something to the long form non attention deficit content stream a hangout a conversation now i don't always have a guest here but we've always got we've always got otis barking we got willie do and so we have these type of conversations in the studio we talk about these things and we we just travel at this pace from a communication perspective and so i think it's important to put this pace out there into the planet as well now you're going to get some people that they just that the uh, energy level's not there to just stick around and it's not going to be for everyone that's cool there's, there's something for everybody out there but I like to use sort of the original inspiration to do something different than, than exactly what was happening on Unbox Therapy, which was originally being expressed through some musical experimentation, and now sort of f flow that into this alternative communication method from what is typical in this segment and maybe on YouTube more specifically as far as what the prevailing content style is. So if you, if you uh, are willing... If you're a willing participant, I think we can advance this situation, advance our conversations, potentially branch outside the realm of strictly tech-related stuff and see what happens. And uh, have a gathering of sorts, a gathering of minds. And I'll read the comments, I'll read your comments, and I'll keep reading your questions. It's meant to be interactive, so please do remember, send your questions over, will at Lou later. Dot com. I want to get into it. It's a deep dive every time. We put out that last video, said deep dive in it. It's a deep dive every time. You take it where you want to take it. I'll take it where, where I can take it. Or who knows? Willie Do might take it. Or he might tell me to take it somewhere. We don't know where it's going to go. That's the beauty of it. I hope you guys continue to participate. I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's nice. The change of pace. There's some space out there, a little breath of fresh air every so often, even though Will's got allergies from the tree pollen or whatever it is going on. Mm -hmm. A breath of fresh air. There's nothing like it and a change of pace. So we'll keep doing it. You keep showing up. Send the questions. Please do. Will at lulater.com. All right.